Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. Beautiful, beautiful music to bring us right into the Spirit of God and into His throne room. Heavenly Father, we just want to continue in this spirit of worship as we, as we approach Your Scriptures, Lord, as we read of the sacred text, as we contemplate its meaning, its application. Father, we invite the Holy Spirit to enlighten our eyes, illuminate our minds, fill our hearts, um, that we would know You better. Speak now, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this may be a record, 11.30, and I'm up to preach. It's a good thing I, pre I prepared a 90-minute sermon for you. Um, it is uh, it's always, always a great pleasure to be able to, to stand before you and, and think about and contemplate and talk about beautiful truths from the Bible. Um, I'm weaving together certain themes uh, of, of previous uh, sem uh, a series that I did. Before I went to Israel, I did a series on the family of Abraham, looking at the, the early mm. stories of Abraham and some of the meanings and messages of what that family went through and how we can apply it to, to our time. Uh, when I came back from Israel, uh, it was around Easter time, and we had this nice Easter program here with the, uh, uh, the Passion Play um, and then lately we've been talking about education, and so I'm kind of weaving three, all three of those together. It's finals time, whether you're in college, whether you're in high school. Uh, there's a lot of test taking right now, and uh, so I am returning to the story of Abraham, going to be looking at Genesis 22, the offering that takes place there, and, and then talking about how that test um, is so significant. So I, I don't want to get give too much away, but let's uh, let's begin with Galatians chapter three. The Bible says, "Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness." Now, if you remember back to earlier in the spring when we looked at this uh, passage, this is from Genesis fifteen when God speaks with Abraham. He takes him out, shows him the stars of the heavens, and says, "So shall your offspring be, and he, he re reiterates the promise, and it says, Abraham believed, and it was credited or reckoned to him as righteousness. This is decades before uh, the story of Genesis 22, and God already acknowledges the faith of Abraham. It goes on, there, it goes on to say, therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. And if you, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Are you glad that you are a son or daughter of Abraham today? Are you glad to be part of that family? Are you sure? Well, we're going to talk about that in just a second. It's an interesting thought. But because of Children's Church, I, did, I do try to remember to change the kids' quiz to a more of a teen-oriented trivia. And um, Nassim, are you busy? Are you going to help me out here? So Nassim is going to be our uh, technician with the microphone. What color do you like? Oh, yellow, of course. Let's do yellow. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> going to fade in here. I'd love to have your help. And these are, these are questions probably you should know. So let's give the teens, sorry to put you on the spot. I know you love to be called out like this. Let's give the young people the first shot, shot at the questions. What is Abraham best known for? Being old? Believing in God? Lying to Pharaoh? Lying to others? Misusing Hagar or offering Isaac? Just what do you think? Of those options, which ones do you think Abraham is best known for? If our teens are bashful, we might open it up to others. We're going to be here Or our day. young people. I see some young people over here. Vitor, I see you. Oh, I see a hand over there. Oh, Jonathan, gotcha. All the way in the back. You're going to get your steps today, Nassim. Yes, yes, yes. Help us out, Jonathan. Offering Isaac. All right. 
You are right. Now, I'm going to add, uh, it would have been okay to say that his faith, he's known as the father of the faithful, so I would be a little generous on this. I'm a, I'm a merciful teacher. I allow uh, other answers than just maybe the primary one. So he's known as being extremely faithful, and off, obviously the offering of Isaac was the, the height of that, even though, again, remembering long before that, God said he had faith that was enough to reckon him as righteous. So when we think of the story of the offering of Isaac, how old was he? Was he a baby? Was he kind of a, a, a child? Uh, maybe a, a teenager, young adult, mature adult? What, what do we know about how, how old Isaac was? Raise your hand. Now, come on, we don't want to take forever on this. I still have uh, more to say. <laughs> So if, it, if, it, if the young people are not uh, of a mind, I'd, I'd let anybody here. We got a smaller group here today. Let's have uh, someone raise their hand. Is it that you all just don't know? No, you can guess. Someone I heard a teenager for somewhere. Well, someone's going to have to say it in the mic. Who said that? All right. Teenager. Oh, thank you, Kim. You're so merciful. It's like when someone gives you a courtesy laugh when you tell a joke that's not funny. Um, actually, we don't really know. Uh, the word that is used for Isaac is also attributed to older uh, uh, kids. So you'll read some commentaries that will just say, for sure he was 15. We know absolutely he was 15. You'll read other commentaries that say, we know he was 30. It's clear he was 30. The Bible doesn't say, we know enough, he's not a baby. And you'll see artistic depictions sometimes of this guy, you know, like a little three-year-old. Uh, and and uh, he, was he was walking with his father. He's talking with his father. He's carrying the wood on his back. Um, he is a teenager. He's not called a child. He's called um, uh, a lad, which again, in other places in Scripture, that very word is used for older teenagers or even young adults. So he is he, he, he's not a baby. He's not a young child. He's older. What does Isaac mean? Blessings, happiness, patience, laughter, Savior. What does Isaac mean? Oh, I see some hands back here. Laughter. Laughter. Isn't that a good name? That's right. His name is Laughter. Even more specifically, Sarah's Laughter. Sarah's laughter. The word does mean laughter, but he was named because Sarah laughed. Now, both, it's funny, uh, that's why it's laughter, funny. Uh, both Abraham and Sarah laughed when God continued to repeat his promise, no, uh, Sarah's going to have a baby. Both Abraham and Sarah would laugh at different times. But Sarah's laughter is what is attributed for Isaac's name being laughter, laughter. Where does Abraham offer Isaac? Is it Mount Moriah, Mount Carmel, Mount Sinai, Mount Nebo, or the Mount of Olives? Do you remember the name of the place? Mount Moriah, Mount Carmel. Ivandro, he wants to help out. This is like an auction. If you move anything, I'm going to call on you. We got a bid over here. <laughs> Uh, my wife said. I'm sorry, sir. I have to accept your bid. Moria. Moria. Uh, Mount Moriah. That is correct. That is Mount Moriah, by the way. That's Mount Moriah. Isn't it beautiful? It's Mount Moriah, Nevada, but it is Mount Moriah. <laughs> I use this one because today Mount Moriah has got the Temple Mount on it. When Abraham came to it, it would have been an undeveloped, uh, rugged mountain. Um, the Jebusites, where the city of David is now, they were beneath the mountain. But when Abraham came, came to Mount Moriah, it was this untouched peak um, like you would see here. And so I put Mount Moriah, Nevada, on the picture for you uh, instead of the Temple Mount. Okay, last question. Do you, this is just a, a, for rhetorical purposes. Do you really want to be a child of Abraham? You want to lay on that altar and have your dad say, here's the plan, son. Interesting thought, isn't it? We celebrate. Oh, we are sons and daughters of Abraham. Well, look what Abraham did with his son of promise. Well, maybe that's a somewhat pejorative way of looking at it. Let's get into the story a little bit. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 22, one of the most 
famous, dramatic, mm-hmm. bizarre, mm-hmm. maybe even controversial stories in all the Bible, certainly all the Old Testament, is this strange story of Genesis 22. Again, just for the context, probably a roughly 50 years after Abraham has left the land of the Chaldeans, the land of his father, God tests Abraham's faith. So he'll live in the promised land for about 100 years. He's 75 when he leaves Ur, and he dies at 175. So this is like right in the middle-ish. Again, we're not told exactly how old Abraham is, but again, if, if Isaac is a young adult at this time, Abraham uh, may have been about 125 or so. At the, but he's been living in the land of promise, faithfully following God. Yes, having problems. There were some mistakes. There were some issues. But he's been following and serving and, and, and loving the Lord for about 50 years. And then the Lord decides to test him, which in and of itself raises interesting questions. Why did he need to test him? The Bible already says that Abraham, all the way back in Genesis 15, maybe as many as 40 years earlier, because we know he was about 84, 85 in Genesis 15, um, already back then God said, you're good. You believe. You are righteous. I am crediting you righteousness. Why then, 40 years later, did God say, yes, but let's just test this theory? So that's just an interesting question as well with the story of Genesis 22 and the offering of Isaac. By the way, this story is not normative. In other words, this is not uh, the typical or the expected or the, uh, the example that we are to follow in Scripture. This is the only time that you'll see this, again, somewhat bizarre and radical uh, experience of God asking an individual to sacrifice uh, a child of theirs. Not only that, God will expressly forbid this later on in the law of Moses. And so keep in mind, this was a test. God never intended that, that Abraham would actually sacrifice Isaac. This was a test. This was a symbol. This was a metaphor that he asked Abraham to go through. But even if you accept that, it still begs the question, Why? Why? What was the purpose of this? But the story is not normative. We don't see this all throughout scriptures. We don't see other examples of the prophets saying, if you were to follow God, you, you should go uh, sacrifice your child, and maybe the Lord will stop you, maybe not, but you need to do it. Okay, this is not uh, 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 ordinary. This is extraordinary, extraordinary, and, and we just need to keep that in mind. Obviously, the shadow of the cross looms largely over this story because of its powerful connections to the imagery of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the work of God with His Son who would die on the cross. But we cannot forget that there was an original audience. Moses writes this story, and the original audience was the Exodus generation. They were the ones receiving this story, and it was for their benefit originally that they needed to know this. And to think of it through that context adds an additional awareness and layer of why God records this story. Why did the children of Israel need to know that their ancestor Abraham had once laid Isaac upon an altar and was prepared to follow the command of God and execute him and burn him? Why was that important? What did that teach them? What lesson was to be received? This is a unique and final test that God would give to Abraham and to only Abraham and yet it is enshrined in Scripture as a lesson for all believers who would follow. So these are just some of the, the ideas that we're going to be exploring, some of the elements of this story when we look at the final test. Genesis 22, you can follow along in your Bible, or you can follow along on the screen. I have it on the screen, so I'm going to set my Bible over to the side. so My arm doesn't get tired. All right, Genesis 22, beginning in the first verse. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham. We are getting somewhat late in the narrative of the story of Abraham. There's a few stories that fall after this. There's the finding of the bride for Isaac, um, and there's, uh, uh, the, you know, obviously the death of Sarah takes place. So there's a few stories that take place in the latter 50 years. He marries Keturah after Sarah's death and has additional children. But really, the bulk of the story of Abraham, the major I guess the major stories of Abraham have already taken place by the time we get here. 
Okay, so there's been some problems, there's been some pitfalls, there's been some lying, there's been some misuse. Hagar and Ishmael have been uh, 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 escorted out of the community by this time, okay, and it's been a while since they've left, okay, because uh, Isaac was still a baby at that time. So the Bible says now at a later period, doesn't tell us exactly, but after these things, God tested Abraham. Now, how many of you like to be tested? How many of you just think that's such a privilege and an honor? It's almost like taxes. We know we have to do it, but we hate doing it, right? And we might, you know, console ourselves, well, taxes go to some tests, have some value, but we don't really like it. We don't like the idea of others testing us. Have you ever tested your spouse? Just to see what they do? You leave the vacuum cleaner in the middle of the living room? I wonder how long it'll be before she sees it. I've never done that. I just, I'm just saying. <laughs> it doesn't usually go well, all right? But here you have God testing Abraham. We'll talk about that. And he says uh, to Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I, or here I am. He'll say that three times in the story. And then God says this, take your son, your only son, son, who you love, Sarah's laughter. Sarah's laughter. And go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I will tell you. And that's the entire uh, uh, narrative of God uh, in this story uh, to this point to Abraham. Now, this is is unique. Now, in Genesis 22, you have so many unique elements. You have unique Hebrew phrases that are not found anywhere else in the Bible. You have unique markers in the Scripture that are not found anywhere else in the Bible. Um, But there's a couple of things that I just want to point out here. A burnt offering was a voluntary act of worship, okay? It was an optional, voluntary act of worship in which the entire sacrifice is consumed. Every other, the sin offering, guilt offering, thank offering, peace offering, these other offerings, there was an element of the offering that was preserved. It was either payment to the priest or, or the, the part of the meat was kept or part of, the, you know, the pelt was sold or something like that. But a burnt offering was the entire thing was consumed. It was was what Noah offered um, after he came out of the ark. Uh, A burnt offering was offered in the Garden of Eden. Um, Abraham knew what this was, and he knew that it was uh, uh, something that God had asked him. He had offered many burnt offerings in his time. And, and, God, and God makes it clear that Abraham knows exactly who he's talking about. He says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Now, it's not that he didn't have other sons, but Isaac was the only son of promise, not of the flesh. Take your son, the one whose name means laughter. Now, it's interesting, Abraham has talked to God many times before this. There had been many stories of God talking to Abraham and conversing with him. And in every other conversation before this where God and Abraham talk, two things happen. One, God always follows his command with promise. Abraham, leave your country, leave the house of your relatives, leave your family, and I will bless you. I will make you a blessing. Those who curse you will be cursed. Those who bless you will be blessed. And all through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Abraham, trust in me, believe in me, and I will make your descendants like the sand of the seashore or the stars of the sky. In every other dialogue, the command of God, the request of God is followed with promise, but not here. No promise is attached to this. Abraham, take now your son, your only son, the one whose name is Sarah's laughter, the joy of your wife. Offer him up as a burnt offering. No, and, and there's no therefore. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve this. I'm gonna do something amazing. Second thing that's unique about this, in every other dialogue with Abraham talking to God or God talking with Abraham, Abraham responds to God. Abraham converses with him. Oh, Lord, oh, that Ishmael would stand before you. No, Abraham, it's not Ishmael. I have determined that it's the descendant of Sarah. Sarah's going to have the seed. Oh, Lord, please, let it be something else. Okay, or even back uh, earlier uh, in Genesis 15, he said, May Eliezer, may, oh, Lord, why is it that a servant in my household is destined to be, uh, uh, you know, the one who inherits my wealth? He always converses with him. But not in this story. These are two amazingly significant elements to the opening of this dramatic Bible story. Abram says nothing, and God offers no promise. It is simply Abraham. Take your son, 
offer him as a burnt offering. Now, I want to come back to this idea. We should not uh, uh, be shocked that God tests us. When God tests us all throughout the Bible, God offers examples, ways in which we can work with God to show the strength of our faith. Jesus does this in the New Testament. It's all over in the Old Testament. Moses, again, Moses is the author of Genesis. He is, the children of Israel are being tested dramatically in the wilderness, aren't they? There's fiery serpents, there's, there's evil empires trying to conquer them, there's, uh, uh, there's you know, hunger, and they need water, and they need to go down the king's highway. There's all these challenges that they're having, and then Moses says, well, you know what? Your ancestor faced some tests as well. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, in order that the fear of Him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. God tests us to build our faith, to strengthen us, so that we may not sin, so that we can draw close to Him, so that we can work out the convictions and beliefs that we had. Yes, Abraham was declared righteous back in Genesis 15, but this was now a needed necessary opportunity for him to follow the Lord in this dramatic way. Another place, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. At one time, God tested Moses himself. Um, uh, the children of Israel were, were uh, stiff-necked and they were rebellious. So God came to Moses and said, Moses, I've got a plan. I'm going to move you off to the side. I'm going to wipe these people out. We're going to get rid of them, and we're going to start fresh with you. Do you remember this story? Okay, God came to Moses and said that. He said, we're going to wipe out all these stiff-necked people, and I'm going to have you and your descendants. We're going to build a nation out of you. Now, I find it just as a hypothetical, what if Moses had said, okay, all right, put me in the cleft of the rock, I'm good. But that was not, God was testing Moses. Moses said, be not, no way, Lord. What will happen is everyone will be ashamed. Uh, All the nations will look that you've destroyed your own people. No one's going to want to have anything to do with you. As a matter of fact, I will give my life, blot my name out of the book of life, Moses says. Spare the people and spare your name. It was a dramatic time of illustrating the humility and the passion and the leadership of Moses. But even in that case, Moses questioned God. Not so, Lord. Even Peter in the New Testament. Remember when Peter had the vision of the sheet that came down? And the vision said, Peter, arise, kill and eat. The commandment of the Lord. What did Peter say? No. (laughs) Not so, Lord. I don't understand. What I'm seeing here is not part of your plan. He had the vision three times, and all three times he said no. No. But in this case, Abraham said, okay. So he rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took of his young men with him and Isaac his son. Now, um, just an interesting anecdote. When it says he took two of his young men, in the first century, the rabbis taught that those two young men were Eliezer and Ishmael. Now, the Bible doesn't say that. However, it's interesting. You'll see it both here and you'll see it later. The Bible does not call them servants. It does not call them part of his trained men, like in Genesis 14 when they went out to war. It repeatedly refers to them as his young men. So it's just an interesting thought. I wouldn't build a theology over it. But imagine if Abraham and the two candidates who preceded Isaac, Eliezer and Ishmael, and the four of them were going on this journey together. It just adds a layer of thought and contemplation. And again, this is not outside of what the first century rabbis, either through oral tradition or just through their own interpretation, they actually wrote in the Targums, the two young men were Eliezer and Ishmael. So anyways, and he takes Isaac, his son. Now, people will go into great lengths to talk about, well, did he talk to Sarah? Did he explain to her? Why did he get up early? Was it he was so anxious just to do what God had said? Or maybe he couldn't sleep the night before. You can go through that in your own mind about what dynamics are happening there, why he rose early and did all these things. He split the wood for the burnt offering, rose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, now he's in Beersheba, he's going north to the modern-day city of Jerusalem. It's about a three-day or two-and-a-half days, about 50 miles from Beersheba to get to Mount Moriah. A three-day walk. 
What do you think they talked about? Do you think Isaac noticed something different about dad on this trip? Do you think uh, there was a little bit of, of, of somberness in this trip? Three days, two nights. Finally, they get to Mount Moriah. The three-day element is, is also significant in the story of the gospel as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days, as Jesus was in the heart of the earth for three days. This time of testing, this time of separation, this time of trial. Abram raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. God must have illuminated or put a halo or just give an indication. You see that mountain? That's, that's where it's going to take place. Abraham said to his young men, again, just interesting, how it doesn't, when, when Abraham finds a, a bride for Isaac, it says he asked one of his servants to help with that. He had servants. But when it comes to these young men, it just says his young men. Abraham said to his young men, stay here, in the don- here with the donkey, and I and the lad, this is the first kind of indicator of the age of Isaac. This is a term that's applied to older Teenagers, young adults, even as old as late 20s or early 30s will sometimes be referred to as a lad. I and the lad will go over there and then these immortal worlds, and we will worship and return to you. We will worship, and the, the we is, is uh, uh, assumed in the second part. We will worship and we will return to you. Now, this is an interesting thing. Why would Abraham say that? Why didn't he just say, and we will worship? He makes the statement that we are going to return. Now, there's a couple of things here. One, either he's lying, which he's good at. He has some experience lying. Because his plan and his intention was to execute Isaac on Mount Moriah. Why did he say, we are going to return to you? One, he's either lying or he is uh, not sure he's going to go through with it. Maybe he's going to get to the top and and see, you know, he's just going to kind of go through the motions and then they're going to come back. Or three, he believed God was going to do something miraculous even in spite of the command and Isaac would be spared and Isaac would be returned. But it's just an interesting statement why he would say that when he knew what God's plan was and what he was going to do. We will return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He put it on Sarah's laughter. I keep calling him that. It just adds a dimension to the story. He put it on, and I find this very interesting, knowing that they're on a journey of, of just excruciating you know, obedience to what God had called, you wouldn't think that dad would put the wood on Isaac, right? Why burden your son? Wouldn't you want to remove that burden from, wouldn't you say, I don't want, these are your last hours on earth. I mean, he hadn't told them yet, apparently, but I want you to not sweat any more than you need to. It's just an interesting dynamic. He made Isaac carry the funeral pyre of his own destruction on his back. Isaac carried the wood. And in his hand, he held the fire and he held the knife. It takes about, oh, depending on where you start from, maybe an hour from the base of the mountain to get to the top. These aren't high mountains like we think of, you know, in the Cascades or the Rockies or anything like that. Mount Moriah, it takes, again, depending on where you start, and, and at what pl- place you begin, an hour, maybe two, if you're taking your time. And he's got the fire, and he's got the knife. And then in verse 7, there's an interesting thing that happens that you don't really see in just the translation. It says, Isaac spoke, and then there is a breath mark. There's a hesitation mark in the Hebrew. It is an intentional pause. It's kind of a way in the Bible of saying, um, a hesitation. And there's almost an indication that Isaac stumbled over his words. Isaac began to speak. Isaac opened up his mouth and wasn't quite sure what to say. It's right there in the Hebrew text. There's a hesitation. There's a mark. So it says, Isaac spoke, stopped, and then to his father he said, Avi, my father. Abi. 
Now, again, after three days of walking together, after understanding probably a deep emotional journey that they had, Abraham probably slept very little those nights. You just, have, you just have to imagine. Now, there are those who think that, and again, this is open to interpretation, I get it, that Abraham was just so determined to do the will of God, it didn't even affect him. He was just, let's go, boys, and off we go, and this is the plan of God. I don't think that's accurate at all. These were real human beings that had real emotions, that had real struggles and trials. So I think that this was a very solid moment. So I, uh, Isaac speaks, he says, Abi, father, my father. And Abraham, Abraham says to him, Henani, uh, Benny, here I am, my son. Isaac's thinking, behold the fire in the wood. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? He's old enough to understand what they're doing. He's seen dad build altars before. He's offered burnt offerings before. He's been part of the sacrificial system before. He's never seen this before. He's never seen this, and dad is awfully quiet. I see we have the fire. I've got the wood. In your hand is the knife. You want to know what's missing? Where's the lamb? And Abraham would say in those immortal words, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. It mentions that twice, doesn't it? The two of them walked on together. The two of them walked on together. Isaac knows that there is something very strange happening here. And then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar. He's built many altars. He's a nomad. Everywhere he goes, he builds an altar. He was the ambassador of the burning sands. Wherever he went, he would build an altar. And that altar would stand as an edifice to any who would pass by. This is the altar of Abraham. Come, worship the God. Worship El Shaddai. Worship Jehovah. Here is where Abraham is worshiped. Abraham has built many altars. He mounds the dirt. He finds them so, some stones. He builds a flat place and he arranged the wood. Now, somewhere in this story, he had to have had that conversation with Isaac. Isaac, you asked as we climbed the mountain, where is the lamb? Isaac, you, you are the lamb. Isaac's a young man. He is not a... Abraham did not wrestle him to the ground pin him down like a, like a mutton do, you know, mutton busting and, and, and tie his arms up. Isaac had to be told the plan at some point, and Isaac had to be a willing sacrifice. And that just adds another layer of, of depth yet bizarreness. Isaac was so willing to trust his father, that he, and he was so willing to trust God, that at that moment, he was willing to say, if that's the plan, so be it. You can work it out in your own mind and imagination how this plays out. Abraham still goes through the process of binding his son and laid him on, top of the, uh, on the altar on top of the wood. And then it says, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife. It doesn't say he stretched out his hand with the knife. It says he stretched out his hand and took the knife. Now, pause here just for a moment. On that altar laid the promise of God. On that altar was the child of promise, the seed through which Jesus Christ Himself was to come. He was the darling of Abraham. He was the laughter of Sarah. He was the hope of the church. He was the heir of salvation. And there He lays just about to be sacrificed. And Abram takes the knife, stretches out his hand. And then the story 
tells us about what happened next. And Moses changes the identifier of God here. Previously in the first verse, it says uh, Elohim spoke out to Abram, Abraham. It says God spoke to him and said, Abraham, take now your son, your only son. But Moses changes the name. He says, but the angel of the Lord, Yahweh, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. This is an intentional change in the name of God. It's an intentional indication. Now, it's not that one is different than the other. It's not that, you know, we're talking about two individuals or two different authors here. But throughout the Scriptures, particularly um, the writings of Moses, when God wants, God and through Moses and the Holy Spirit inspiration, when He wants to talk about the, the sovereignty of God, the omniscience of God, the power of God, the Almighty of God, in Genesis chapter 1, it is Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? He is that astounding, sovereign, almost remote creator. When you refer to Him as Elohim, it, it creates a distance between us and Him. He is so far above us. He speaks galaxies into existence. He, 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 he speaks by just His Word. But when God wants to emphasize the intimacy of His personality, when God wants to emphasize the, the uh, presence of Him, He'll use the term Yahweh. This is who, who Moses met, met at the burning bush. He said, if I go to, uh, to Pharaoh and say, let my pe- uh, if I go to the Israelites and to Pharaoh, they're going to say, what's his name? And God says, you shall tell them, I am that I am. You shall tell them that the I am, Yahweh, has sent you. So Moses switches the terminology here and says, the angel of the Lord, Yahweh, the intimate God, now speaks. And he calls out to him twice, Abraham, Abraham. And I'm sure Abraham was kind of gave a little extra shout. We say, yeah, here I am. Third time he said that. Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. Now in the foreknowledge of God, it wasn't that God didn't know what was in the heart of Abraham. It's not that God needed to discover something. It's that God in this process was taking Abraham through this dramatic portrayal of the plan of salvation. And he is confirmed in his actions and in his works, his ultimate trust in God. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold him, a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, offered him up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. So you have this substitute that takes the place. In the place of Isaac, a ram is sacrificed. Isaac is spared, and yet a burnt offering is still offered. A burnt sacrifice is still offered. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh, that's uh, what it means, the Lord will provide, and as it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, again, he returned to his young men, and they arose and went together back home to Beersheba. So what Abraham said earlier when he left the young men, we will return to you. Guess what? He was right. They did return. Isaac was still with them, and they went back home. And again, I leave it to you to imagine in your mind when Sarah asked, hey, where you guys been? Missed you the last few days. What did Abraham say? Uh, I'll let you work that out. What are you doing with my laughter? Well, it's all right. You know, in so many ways, this story is, is so, it, it's fundamental and it's, it's dramatic, and, and yet it also has this very significant oddity to it, and it is not what the norm is for God. So I want to just offer some thoughts about what this final test was for, why God did it in this time, in this place, with this individual. What was this purpose? What was the purpose of the dramatic and brutal test? I'm going to offer several thoughts on this for your contemplation. Obviously, Abraham and Isaac will forevermore illustrate the plan of salvation. This is a, uh, an illustration of ultimate trust in God. And when you have that ultimate trust, you will never fail. Even when you're asked to do things that seem ridiculous and impossible. In, in John chapter 6, Jesus at the, the feeding of the 5,000, he actually says to Philip, he says, Philip, I want you to feed this big crowd. 
And the Bible says he did this to test Philip. And again, Philip said, but Lord, if we had a year's wages, we wouldn't have enough to buy even a morsel for all these people. But it says that Jesus did this knowing the miracle that he had planned, and he did it in order to test Philip. God uses tests to build faith and to illustrate his plan. It is not because he doesn't like us or he doesn't believe in us that he tests us. He tests us to strengthen us, to refine us, to make us stronger. An ultimate trust in God will never fail. I want you to also think about God's trust. We think about Abraham's trust, ultimate faith and belief in God. Also remember that God's trust in Abraham is illustrated here. Just as God trusted Job, God trusted Abraham. He, again, this was a test. This was not God's plan to, to ever see Isaac perish or anything like this. God trusted that Abraham would be faithful in this as an illustration of the plan of salvation. God selected Abraham because he believed in him. When you go through trials, when you go through tests, it's not because, God, where are you? It's because God trusts in you. God looked down on the earth and he saw Job, and even Satan said, well, he's only serving you because you protect him. And God says, no, I trust him. Even if he goes through trials, even if you persecute him, his heart will stay with me. When we go through trials, it's because God knows. When we go through tests, it's because God knows that if we continue to abide in him, all will be well. So it is an evidence of God's trust in Abraham. For Israel, I think it's part of the story that Israel was uh, uh, free from slavery in Egypt, but God wanted them to see that there's also another slavery they needed to be relieved of, and that was slavery to sin. And through the sacrificial process, they were to see the depth of sin, that the wages of sin is death. And they needed to be faithful in following God and going through the sacrificial system because there was a replacement offered in their case. They didn't need to die and their children didn't need to die because God had, support, God had supplied a substitute. But lastly, and I put these together, it's a one-time, only-time portrayal of God's anguish. It's interesting in the, gospel, in the book of James, not the gospel of James. In the book of James, there's three places in the Bible where Abraham is called a friend of God. You know, we sang about that, didn't we? I'm a friend of God. Remember singing that? I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. Did you sing that? Were you here? Did, did you sing it? Did you mean it when you sang it? Why are you a friend of God? How did you become a friend of God? What qualifies you? to be a friend of God. It's interesting that Abraham is upheld in Scripture in a unique way as a friend of God. And in James, James specifically attaches the offering up of Isaac as the reason by which God now calls Abraham a friend. Because Abraham offered up Isaac, God says, you are now my friend. Now, I want you to think about something. Again, we don't want to make God so distant and removed. He's so glorious, so powerful, so omniscient. We don't want to make Him so distant from us that we can't relate to Him, but nor do we want to make Him so uh, similar to us that we lose, you know, the, 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 the dynamic and the glory and the divinity of God. But I want you to remember something. We are made in God's image. We are made to understand the mind and heart and the passion of God. And in this one unique story that you won't see repeated anywhere else in the Bible, there's almost an element of God looking around all creation and saying, I wish there was someone in this whole universe that understood what I am going through. I wish that I had one friend who could relate with me. There is no one in all of creation, no one in this universe that understands exactly what the cost of salvation is. That one day, my son is going to go up that mountain, and he's going to have the wood on his back, and he is going to be placed on a cross, and there will be no ram caught in the thicket when that time comes. There's going to be no angel that cries out and says, spare him. 
I'm going to be there. I'm going to watch him die, and it's going to be excruciating. I just wish there was one who could understand what I'm going through. Do you know that if you've had a significant event in your life, you've lost someone to cancer, or, or you've had a child die, or you've had just a significant, it's so comforting when you can be with someone who can relate with you. Now, we know sympathy. We know that it's good that people say, well, that, that, that you know, I can, I can think about how, but when someone has gone through it, all of a sudden you have kinship. This is why we have support groups. I've suffered from an addiction. Well, I've never suffered from that, but I, I'm glad you're over it now. When you find someone that says, yes, I too have had that addiction and I've worked through it, it creates a bond. It creates a commonality. It creates a friendship. And God looked down on earth and he said, I need a friend. And Abraham is there. Abraham has the possibility. Abraham has the potential. Abraham, will you go through the plan of salvation? Will you take your son? And in the end, God spares him. But did, did Abraham, in his heart and mind, was Isaac spared? In his heart and mind, Abraham was willing to see that death take place. In his heart, the death did take place. In his mind, the death did take place. So there he was spared from it. But in that moment, in some small microcosm, God looks down and he says, Thank you, Abraham, because now I have a friend who knows what it's like to pay the price to sacrifice, let their son go so that others can be free. And James says it's because of that that Abraham was called a friend of God. Now, again, this story is not normative. I am not at all suggesting that this is something we all need to do. However, the story is there so that we can at least imagine it. So that we can think of it. Jesus makes it clear in the New Testament. If you love your father, mother, sister, son or daughter more than me, you're unworthy of the kingdom. He's not talking about affection. He's talking about uh, authority and obedience. The, the, the principle of putting God first is all throughout Scripture. We don't have to actually lay our child on an altar, but we can at least imagine it. And we can think about it as the price of our salvation of what God went through. And when you do that... You too, you too can be called a friend of God. The final test, the final test is, are you willing to experience that in your own heart? To put all things aside and to understand what the heart of God has gone through. Um, one of my favorite teachers um, at Walla Walla College, his name was, uh, is, <laughs> he's still there, Paul Diptal. Um, his first year at college as a professor, it's my first year there, so he was just getting used to it. So I spent uh, three and a half years working with Dr. Diptal on, on various things. I just really enjoyed him. After I graduated and uh, left college and was working uh, in the Upper Columbia Conference, uh, a few years later, we happened to meet at just a, a workers' meeting of some kind where some of the the uh, professors were there, and I saw them. Now, I was raised in a very formal kind of atmosphere. I, I was raised, you call people Mr. and Mrs. You call your teachers, you know, Dr. Dipdahl and, you know, and Mr. Picone. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw you there. Uh, and, and that was what etiquette was. That's what, you know, uh, politeness required. Um, and so I saw Dr. Dipdahl, and I went up, and I said, hey, good to see you, Dr. Dipdahl. And he goes, you know what, Dave? You've graduated. You're out of school. You're in the ministry. Call me Paul. Let's just be friends. You've passed the test. You've passed the test. Now we're friends. You've graduated. No longer are you the student and me the the teacher, the master, we're now friends. Abraham passed the test. And God said, now, now I have a friend, someone who can relate with me. Greater love has no one, no one than this, 
that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, and the commands are love. Love is fulfilled. If you live bound by love, we are friends. No longer do I call you slaves. Slave doesn't know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I've heard from my Father. I have made known to you. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. Lay aside all other things. Make God first in your life. And not only will He spare and save your loved ones and give them opportunities to thrive, but you will be able to relate to the King of the universe more intimately than ever before. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Are you a friend of God today? Then you pass the test. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, so much is bound up in these dramatic stories. We've only scratched the surface of the potential and the, the paradigm, the possibilities. But God, thank you that we can analyze and think about this story and we can learn from it. I think it's so remarkable, Lord, how you work in our lives. And if we are keeping our eyes open, if we are looking through the eyes of faith, we will not view our tests and trials as burdens or as anything that we can't handle. If we trust in you, we know that you will always be by our side and we will walk together and you will be our friend. And if we have you as our friend, what have we to fear? Thank you for the faith of Abraham. Thank you that we can all be sons and daughters of Abraham. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today here at the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. We look forward to seeing you again next week, and um, have a wonderful Sabbath.